viewers, my name's Kara. I'm your host for Tuesdays on Pagan Perspective, and this week we are revisiting the topic of numerology. We covered numerology in year two of the collab, but only a few people made videos on it that we still have remaining. And I actually didn't make a video that week. I had Annie sub for me. So Rich, Dancing Rabbit, Mo, and Annie made videos on this subject the last time, so we will be getting mostly all new perspectives. Rich, of course, made another video this week, but with a six year difference. Since I didn't get to talk about numerology the first time around at all, anything that I say will be kind of new for me to say on the topic, other than little things that I've said here and there in other videos over the years. The question is just to talk about numerology. There is no specific question about it, but the general question of this collaborative channel in general is how does this relate to our lives? What is our personal perspective on it based on our path? How does it relate to our path? So numerology is the main topic this week, and then there's also a question about books from the same person that's just going to get thrown in there at the end. So talking about numerology, I actually like to tell people these days, and I actually just said this to someone the other day, that I am not a big math person except for numerology. Math was never really my favorite subject in school. I much prefer words to numbers, but as far as numerology and astrology and all those types of things are concerned, the meaning of numbers magically is something that I'm really interested in and something that I can spend hours on and that I have spent hours on. I'm not watching Rich's new video before I record this, which might have been helpful, but I did rewatch a lot of the old videos. So I know that in Mo's original video six years ago, she talked about the core numbers of numerology, such as how to determine your life path number, your destiny number, your soul urge, and your inner dreams or personality number. And there are many, 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 many other things that you can do with that. So basically numerology is the study of numbers and their essences and sort of energies and what they can tell us about the world and about people based on what numbers come up out of either numbers, such as dates that things happened, dates that people were born, or by turning the letters of the alphabet into numbers and then finding their numerological value. So for example, your life path number is found by adding together the numerical values, the date of the month, day, and year that you were born, the full numbers, and then adding them up to a specific number, and then if that number is larger than nine, taking the digits of that number and adding the digits together again and again until you get down to a number that is between one and nine or is 11 or 22. 11 and 22 can be further broken down to two and four to get your prime numbers, but 11 and 22 are also considered master numbers, so some systems take those into account. So that's your life path number. Your destiny number is taking the numerological value associated with the letters in your full birth name, the name that you were given at birth, the entire thing, and assigning the numbers to that and then adding that up and breaking it down the same way. There are many charts that you can find online that show how to do this, such as the letter A is the first letter of the alphabet, so A is equivalent to one, B is two, C is three, D is four, etc. but only using the numbers one to nine. So we go all the way up to the letter I with number nine, and then J goes back up to number one, K is two etc. So that's the basic idea of how it's done. You can either look at words and turn them into numbers and then find out the numerological value, or we're looking at numbers and just adding them together in the first place. And from that basis, there are so many things that can be done. So as I mentioned, and that Mo talked about in her previous video, and Annie touched on this in her previous video as well, those are your life path and your destiny numbers. It's your full name and your full birth date. But there's also a lot of other things you can do, such as taking just the vowels in your full name or just the consonants in your full name, and those say different things about you. You can look at the month and day that you were born as a birthday number instead of the exact date, including the year, giving you your life path. A big way that I use numerology currently in my practice is in combination with the system of the tarot and when reading tarot. 
So some of the cards in tarot, the minor arcana, are what are known as pips sometimes if they are non-scenic cards. So they have numbers that are associated with suits. You have the Ace of Swords and the Two of Swords and the Three of Swords, etc. And in a traditional Rider Waite style deck and other illustrated decks, those cards can have full drawings that sort of give you the meaning of the card. And by looking at that, you can say, okay, what's going on in this picture? And what does this represent? But there are other decks that are strictly, like the picture is just, there are two swords. That's it. And so if you don't already know or have the meaning memorized of what the Two of Swords means, one way that you might go about figuring that out is if you know what the Suit of Swords represents, and then if you know what the number two represents. So this is where the numerology factor comes in. And I use this with my oracle cards as well, any cards that are associated with numbers such as the fairy ring that I read, is broken down into suits of seasons, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And the cards are numbered from the ace to, what are they numbered to? And then there are court cards as well. So it's very similar to the minor arcana. And where, for example, the number four in tarot often refers to stability and structure because it forms a square and a very solid base and foundation, in the Fairy Ring Oracle, the four cards, to me, all represent, within the character that they depict, they all represent something to do with fate. So in that deck, I have the mental association that the four cards are about fate, and the six cards are about something to do with love and commitment. Whereas in the tarot, four represents structure to me, and six might represent friendship, but not always. Actually, I think the key word that I just learned for the sixes has to do with adjustments, transcending, and finding equilibrium, whereas the individual sixes, the six of swords is about flight and safety, the six of cups is about nostalgia and sentimental values, the six of wands is about triumph and victory, and the six of coins or pentacles is about generosity and giving. In a way, I could find a way to make those all about friendship or something involving other people, at least. Like, you can still see where that kind of combines, but then in the Fairy Ring Oracle, they're usually about love in some way. So it can differ depending on the deck, but there's this idea that when you don't know something else about it, you look at what you know about that number. Fives for me are obviously very spiritual because of the pentagram or the pentacle, the five-pointed star, and nines are a very potent goddess number in my practice, as well as threes, and of course nine is three times three, so it's just kind of the three elevated to a different effect. So all kinds of associations like that. You can also use numerology to find the tarot card that is associated with your year, your personal year's energy maintained by a major arcana card. So that's what people are talking about when we talk about year cards. And if you are sponsoring my personal channel videos on Patreon, that is at patreon.com slash cutewitch772, I have done some private videos for my patron sponsors only that are about year cards and going a little bit more in depth with that, talking about mine, doing some calculations for some other people, some famous people, talking about how I learned the specific system that I use for year cards, which is based on the system used by Mary Kay Greer, which you can read about in her books, and you can read a lot of them actually for free online. I saw a lot of the workbook talking about the basic aspects of it that you can just find for free. But different people use different systems. The same is true of tarot in general, as well as numerology. So there are some systems I mentioned that use the master numbers 11 and 22. Some systems will use any repeated numbers, so going on to 33, 44. I typically just consider 11 and 22 to be the master numbers. And some systems don't use them at all, so you will always break down 11 and 22 to their smaller forms of 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 2 is 4. So you'll always break them down. Some people, when determining the year card, if they're using the system like Mary Kay Greer uses, which is the one that I like to use, is if you want any major arcana card to be taken into account, you reduce to any number between 1 and 22 so that you can represent all cards in the major arcana and 22 represents the fool because you will never add up to get zero. So 22 
is the equivalent of the fool in that system. Other people will still just break it down to one through nine, so you're only ever dealing with the magician through the hermit. That's not the way I like to work. I like to use the entire major arcana when I'm doing that, so I use the system that is anything between one and 22 is your final number, and then you break it down further from there to learn other things. Just as an example of how crazy that can get and how crazy that can look, I did my year cards for the time since I was born to past age 100. And then I did this, well, to age 100. I just stopped at 100. And I also did this for a couple of my friends. So here is a sneak peek. I've, I've covered names and birth dates, so I'm trying to keep anything really personal out of it. But this is what it looks like when I do someone's entire chart from their birth to age 100, finding out their year card in the tarot. It looks like an accounting spreadsheet or something. I don't know, I'm not an accountant, so maybe this looks nothing like that. But to me, that's what it looks like. It's just a bunch of numbers. It's the year, how old they are that year, or yeah, how old they'll be on their birthday that year, the year, the numerological value of their birthday and the year, and then breaking that all down to whatever their number is between one and 22 of that year. So this friend that I did it for, their birth year card, which would also be their life path number, it's your birth date, was eight. The next year was a nine, then a 10, 11, 12, 13, but then when they turn six, the way that the numbers add up, instead of moving on to the number 14, temperance, their year card moved back down to number five, the hierophant. So that's the end of a cycle when it drops back down, and then it goes five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and then drops back down to six. So you have these cycles. So I have blue lines in between the different cycles that they have. So this is one of the many, many, many things that you can do with numerology, one of the things that I like to do. Other ways that I use numerology in my practice, a big way is when talking about names and magic names. I do not use any magic names publicly because I just use my name, Karamiya, and that has worked for me because it's not, it's not a big deal for me to keep my first name private or anything like that. And I have a spiritual connection with my given name. Not everyone does. And it can also add a level of just kind of feeling special to have a magic name. So there are magic names that I have that I use within my practice. They are not things that I share publicly. But whenever something like that comes up, one of the first things I do besides feel like, okay, does this name itself resonate with me, is to figure out the numerology of it. And if it happens to match up with the numerology that I already have somewhere in my core numbers, then I feel like, oh wow, this is a really good match for me because this name already has a very similar number, whether it's my life path or my destiny or whatever. But you can also choose a magic name or change the spelling of a name slightly to reach a number essence that is something that you want to resonate with that might not already be represented in your name or your birth date. And there are similar things you can do with looking at how many times each letter appears in your name, how many times each number shows up in your name based on the letters. I just did this today because I was looking through a website before doing this video and I found out that my name has the average number of threes, fours, and sevens. My name has more than average ones, twos, and nines, and my name has below average, in fact, no, that is I have none of these, fives, sixes, and eights in my name. So something that I might want to do, especially since five, six, and eight are not my life path number, five is one of my numbers. It's my inner dreams number, but it's not one of the really major ones, and six and eight don't exist anywhere in my core numbers. If it is important to me to have the energy of five, six, and eight, somewhere because those are missing and if that's something that I want to bring into my life to achieve some kind of balance and have a little bit of that energy which is missing, then I might choose a magic name that resonates with five, six, or eight. For example, that's just one thing that you could do. Annie, in her video from six years ago, mentioned that she uses numerology to determine what day she will do a working for someone else. So if someone wants her to do a spell, she'll take your full name, figure out what your number resonance is, and then she looks at what 
planet that is associated with and from that planet finds the day of the week that resonates with that. So a lot of numerology involves multiple steps. It's not just breaking something down to a number, but then it might be taking that number and finding the planet and then from that planet finding the day or something to that effect such as breaking it down and finding the card that is your major arcana tarot card for that year or whatever it may be. So it can get really complicated and I think that's why a lot of people are kind of turned off by it. They don't want to do a lot of that work, but it can also just be very simple. You can just do the really basic things, but there's always plenty more to elaborate on and go further and further and further down that rabbit hole if that's something you want to do. And that's how I ended up doing this for hours. But once I did it once and found out how it worked, it went much faster the subsequent times because I realized how the cycles work and so you can anticipate things at that point and you can kind of take some shortcuts. I also use numerology just in the basic sense of correspondences. So when I'm doing a spell, it might have to do with what day of the week do I want to do it, but for the most part when I use number correspondences, it might be, you know, I'm gonna use a candle for this spell. Should I just go ahead and use one candle or should I use a certain number of candles based on the energy that I want for this? You know, would it make sense to have one green candle but five white candles or something like that? So knowing what the numbers mean to me magically also helps me determine whether I can use a certain number of something in my spell, such as three ribbons to form a braid versus five candles two different colors of something, six different ingredients to put together into this charm, whatever it may be. And what the numbers mean to you in this sense may or may not be the same as the numerology associations you have for the tarot. Some of mine from my Book of Shadows are one represents unity, independence, creativity, two represents balance and duality and polarity, three represents of course the trinity, cooperation, harmony, four is building and order, four corners, stability, skipping a few, eight has to do with transformation and renewal, nine is the triple triad as I mentioned before, healing, joy, hidden influences, and is a supreme spiritual number, ten is ultimate manifestation, which is also what it represents in the tarot, it's the end of the cycle, it's the completion and culmination point, point. and eleven being a master number represents self-mastery and success. So that's just a little taste of that. The second part of the question this week was about some must-read books. They were wondering if we have ever read Drawing Down the Moon by Margot Adler or Pagans and the Law, the author of which I cannot remember right now. I have indeed read and own a copy of Margot Adler's Drawing Down the Moon, which is Druids, Goddess Worshippers, and Other Pagans in America. This is a must-read book for a reason, I will say, but I will also say that I did not bother attempting to read this book until I had already been on this path for about a decade. I either started this book while I was in college or when I finished college. I can't really remember right now, but it was sometime around then. Oh look, I even did this thing. As I was reading this book, I wrote a note which is intended to be put into another copy of this book, either at a bookstore or a library or something, telling future readers of this book what I thought of it. So let me just read you what I wrote. So I wrote, Dear fellow seeker, I think some books are best read at a certain point along our paths. This book came in a decade along for me, and at this time I can say I love it. If this is the time for you, I highly recommend it as it contains so much new and interesting material on things that are older and therefore influential. It's good to get a sense of our roots, though as this book says at some point, the roots are only part of the tree. Blessings, C. So good to know that that is still in my copy of the book. Like, I, I'm not taking it with me to anywhere that I might run into another copy of the book, but that's what I wrote it for. So yeah, that holds true. I definitely recommend this book if it's the right time for you. But because it is a history book, and it is fairly thick, it's not something that's going to be of interest to everyone right away, I feel. And it's not something that you have to read right away at the beginning, but it absolutely gives a lot of historical background context. There are some photos in here, but you know, it's it's a normal like amount of small print and it's a big book. So you, you can get a sense of it just looking at it. And there are lots of resources in the back. So actually this is appendix three at this point. So where's, 
So this is the actual book. From here to here is the actual book. And then we have Appendix 1 is Scholars, Writers, Journalists, and the Occult. I have a specific edition of this, I think. This is the completely revised and updated version. Appendix 2 is some rituals. Appendix 3 is resources such as magazines, websites, and things like that that have existed throughout time. Resources, resources, resources. So this section here is just the appendices, three of them. And then from there to there is notes on the text and the bibliography and index make up this last section. But a good amount of this is the book. The first main section is background about paganism and prejudice, pagan worldview, etc. Section 2 is about witches, everything from the Wiccan Revival and the Craft Today, these are chapter titles, to women, feminism, and the craft. The third section is about other neo-pagans, starting with religions from the past, and also talking about things like radical fairies and the growth of men's spirituality. And then the fourth section is the material plane, the chapter title is Living on the Earth. So this really is an amazing resource. I do think that every pagan should read it at some point, but I do not necessarily believe that it's necessary to push someone to read it really, really super soon. But if you're someone like me who is really into history or anything else, when it is a subject that you are heavily interested in, then I think it's definitely worth it to spend a few years figuring out if paganism seems like the right path for you. And then when you know you're really into it, you'll be ready to really dive into this, you know, thick book of history about this thing that you already know you love and is a part of you. So that's how I see it. The other book, Pagans and the Law, I have not read but I also understand why it is a must read for pagans. And I think if you can get your hands on it, go absolutely go ahead and do it. I think what is really important about that is that that book is about understanding your rights as a pagan, understanding that paganism is protected as religion under the law, at least in the United States, and understanding just kind of how the law relates to us as far as you know, people asking us to take off our jewelry in public places, or people asking us to not be in certain places, etc, etc. You know, there, there are these horror stories that occasionally some of us deal with. Someone just asked me the other day whether things like that have ever happened to me, and yes, they have, but it's a very uncommon occurrence anymore. I have vlogs on my personal channel about times that they have happened, and it's really only been like three or four major things throughout my life, and they are separated by several years between them. So it's not a a hugely common thing but when it does happen or especially like if you have kids if your kids are in public school and someone else finds out that you're a family of witches and they're the other kids parents decide to start some trouble or whatever it's important for you to understand what your rights are and how to communicate with people about how paganism fits into the law you know years ago it wasn't even acceptable yet to have the pentacle on military gravestones but we now have that right for military pagans and other symbols are also in the works if not have already passed. I only remember specifically about the pentacle, but these are things that people are working on constantly. And so that is what I think is really important. And I think that nowadays there are other resources that you could get that information from as well. So it's not necessarily that book in particular, but yeah, sure, go for it. That book you know, that book is recommended for a reason as well. I have not read that specific one, but I have done other research elsewhere about our relationship with the law, and I think that is really the important takeaway from that. So thank you, I'm sorry that video was a little bit longer, although I'm not sorry at the same time because I know that people who don't want to watch it will have just clicked away after the four and a half minute mark. My analytics don't lie, I know. So for the rest of you, you're welcome. I'm sure you enjoyed this long video and thank you very much for watching the whole entire thing. Applause for you. I will see you next time and until then, don't forget to be awesome, blessed be, and goodbye.